Bill's getting her. All right, there we go, Bill. It's good to have Bill up there. All right, kids, practice time, practice good. I want to be amazed next week. It's all on your shoulders, Ellen. Thanks. (laughs) All right, I know it is. Um, Great song, Bonnie. That was that's a that's a tremendous message. the yes, Bethlehem missed its king. Jerusalem missed its king. America, are we going to miss our king when he comes again for the second time? That's a good, good, good song. Uh, Davis County, are we going to miss what the king is doing right now here in Bloomfield, Iowa, here in southeast Iowa? Are we, are we ready to get to work and do what Jesus Christ wants us to do? to bring as many lost souls as possible into the kingdom, to live out a life that shines the glory of God through us, through what we do, through the personalities that He has given us, through the, through the skills and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, the abilities, the, the gifts that He has given us. Are we willing to live those out so that we can reach as many people as we possibly can to share the love of Christ with them? Amen. Um, I'm going to share a joke that has nothing to do with anything other than I thought it was a pretty funny joke. And my, my uncle, I was a, we were at a Christmas party yesterday uh, in Des Moines. And my, my uncle, who, who I, I grew up, he's my great uncle actually, uh, but I grew up, uh, and he was, he's a truck driver, uh, so he's a little on the crude side sometimes, okay? No offense to any truck drivers uh, or any truck drivers that you know. I've known several, but he was just, he was a little, little crude at times. And so my mom would always caution us when we went to family gatherings. Uncle Fred's funny man. He's a funny guy, but be careful. Uh, just, you know, she would, she would just caution us. So anyways, he's telling us, and, and, and it was so, it was actually, he and I had a, a connection last night. They've, they, him and his wife, my Aunt Susie, they, they, they've gone to church all their lives, but they, they never really had, they never, they never shared any kind of faith. And last night, we were sitting at dinner, um, and he started telling me this joke, and, after, and I'll, I'll share the joke with you in just a second, but after the, after the joke, he, he looked at me and he said, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm very proud of, of what God is doing in your life. And it was just, uh, he had never said anything like that to me before, um, in all the years that, that, that I've known my Uncle Fred, which is all my life, but he, uh, it was just, it was such a heartwarming moment to know that God reaches imperfect people. Amen? Uh, and, I, and I include myself in that. We're all imperfect people, and God reaches every single one of us. And so it was just, it was a good moment for me. Anyway, here, here's a joke. Um, this, 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 these twin boys uh, had grown up in this town, and they were, they were not good men, okay? They, they had grown up. They were old men at this point. They were not good. They had lied and cheated and stolen, and just in all kinds of, of bad things in this town. And they come time, one of the twin boys dies, and they go to the, to, the, to the pastor there in the town and says, Pastor, I want you to do the eulogy. Uh, pastor's like, okay, uh, I don't know what you want me to say, but uh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll do the, the funeral service and I'll, I'll perform a eulogy. And, and the, the living brother says, but I want you to say that my brother was a saint. Okay, I want you to, I'm not, I'm not messing around. I, I need you to say he was a saint. Um, I don't want him to go off into eternity uh, with everyone thinking badly about him, so, passion. Whew. He he agrees. Goes back to his his to the office to whatever. Working it out. Time comes for the funeral. Time to to give the eulogy, and he stands up there, and he lets the guy have it. He said, "This guy cheated everybody. Guy lied to everybody. He he stole. He just it was awful, 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 awful. But compared to his brother." He was a saint. So anyways, that was, that was my joke. Uh, my, my uncle told me that uh, last night, and that, I thought that was funny, so I thought I'd share that. It has nothing to do with anything uh, other than just get a cheap laugh out of y'all. So, all right. Joseph's joy. That's what we're going to talk about today. We've talked about, we've gone from Luke, the first two weeks of this series on looking at the birth of Jesus Christ. We've gone from the birth of, or the, from the book of Luke. Um, and Luke is very factual. I said that last week. He's very, very matter of fact. He was a doctor. He was actually um, uh, paid to follow the disciples, the apostles around and just write down what he saw. And so he was very much, 
Very much factual. Just, just here's, here's the details. This is what they are. Boom, boom. Matthew, he writes from the perspective of writing to all the Jews. Okay, so it's a very patriarchal idea. He's writing to this thing. So he, the first 17 verses of Matthew is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Very important to the Jewish tradition that they follow, that everything flows from that this begat, this begat, this begat. Because it was important, bloodlines are very important. They had to know exactly who was entitled to what. And so Jesus came from the line of David, very important. And then he gets to the story of Joseph. And to continue on to speaking to, to the Jewish culture of that time, he would have written from a, a man's perspective. Okay, And that's where he comes from. So now we get the perspective of, from this story, the Jesus story's birth from the perspective of Joseph. We talked about Mary last week, a little bit about Joseph. Now we're going to talk about Joseph completely here in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And now I'm going to, just going to read this through and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful in the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Pause real quick right there. Read that one again. Apply this to your own life. See what you think. When Joseph woke up, he did what the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Verse 25, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. First of all, I just want all you people to look at this row of teenagers here. We have, we have five teenagers sitting here. They've all five got a Bible in their hands. That's just, that's, that's not very common. So well done, teenagers. Well done. All right. I enjoy seeing that. They're all look. They're dirty. They're 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 dirty looking me right now. It's all right. I get to say what I want. I have the microphone. Okay. All right. I get to. Uh, it's been fun. I've got to be with them the last two Wednesday nights. Um, uh, working with the teenagers through through the month of December on Wednesday nights, and it's been fun. Uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have some more fun the next couple weeks. So, um, but you guys are in for a for a treat. Okay. Moving on. Uh, so we've talked about the, the idea that, that God's fulfilled his prophecies um, at slow, slowly through the course of time sometimes, and then sometimes very quickly. And this story of Jesus is happening very, very quickly, right? The, the angels show up, and boom, Mary's pregnant, right? This is happening quickly. It's moving very, very quickly. And, and, and there's no time, really, to say, okay, is this what I want to do? Is this not what I want to do? What am I supposed to do? Mary's pregnant, okay? Now we've got to deal with this thing, right? We've got to, this is the situation in front of me. I've got to deal with it, okay? That happens all the time. We have situations that just pop up in our lives. We've got to deal with it. And that's why verse 24 is so important to me. As I was, I couldn't get away from that verse 24. I read it twice. When Joseph woke up, he did what the Lord, angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. He didn't hem and haw. He didn't say, okay, is there any other way out of this? He had already considered what he was going to do. He said in verse uh, something, verse 22, no, verse uh, 20, after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him and told him all this stuff. So he considered it. He thought about what he's going to do. Am I going to divorce her? Am I going to, what am I, what am I, what am I going to be able to do in this situation in particular? God shows up through the angel of the Lord, tells him what to do. And he gets up and he does it. Right? How many times can we say that about our lives? When you, when you find out that God wants you to do something, do you get up and do it? Or then do you consider it after you've been told what God wants you to do? Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's the latter. I tend to uh, find out what God wants me to do and then I kind of, Eh, I don't know, God. I, I, think, I, I, think, I think if you just hear me out, uh, we can come up with a better solution uh, to, this, to this particular uh, situation that we're in. And no, it's, it's, it's a get up and do what God has commanded you to do. Um, and I think that's a great example from Joseph there. Anyways, Joseph, 
It says he was a faithful man. He knew the law. Uh, he didn't want to expose Mary to public disgrace, so he was going to divorce her quietly. Um, it says a lot about who he was as a man and, 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 and that he was a, a, a good man. Um, he was probably a poor man. In Luke chapter 2, it talks about some of the, uh, the things that they had to go through um, uh, with this birth and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And it gives and, and alludes to um, uh, a lower income family for Joseph and Mary. Uh, he is he is engaged to Mary. He's got dreams, right? Uh, I remember uh, when I got engaged to Rachel. There's a lot of lot of fun things to dream about. Uh, a lot of fun things to think about, and put, and so you put yourself in this situation. Think about when when you became engaged, and 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 the, and the, the hopes that were, were 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 flooding your mind, the dreams that were coming through, and how you would envision the future. All of that is happening for Joseph right now. All of that is going on. All of that is taking place in his mind, and he's got the biggest smile on his face because he's about to be married, right? Um, so he goes through. He gets engaged. They're they're they're, they're they've got it. Everything's taken care of. It's probably, probably an arranged marriage. All the money has been given to, to the families. Um, this is sacred. A violation of marriage is very, very serious. <sighs> Society thinks differently today sometimes. Violation of the, 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 the sanctity of marriage is so very important, even today. But society deemed it as, as that important back then. And so it was very, very um, bad <laughs> what happened to Joseph. Uh, through what happened to Mary, at least in his mind at the beginning. Joseph world, uh, Joseph's world comes crashing in on him. He's put into this situation. He didn't have a choice. Mary was pregnant, right? She was pregnant. And he had to say, what am I going to do about this situation? I can't change it. I can't make her not pregnant. I can't, I can't pretend like I've never been engaged to her before. Everybody knows I can't do anything to change this. I can only respond to it. I can only say, okay, here's my situation. Here's my problem. What am I going to do? You got a problem like that in your life today? You got something going on that you wish was different? You wish, you wish the circumstances around it were different? You wish, maybe, maybe you wish the, the things at work were different. Maybe you wish that things at home were different. Maybe you wish that things with your kids were different. Maybe you wish that things, I don't know. Maybe you wish you lived on a beach in Hawaii. I don't know. Yeah, I I would be right there with you. But the situation you're in is the situation you're in, right? All you can do is respond to this situation. Joseph has to respond to Mary being with child. There is no easy situation. Joseph is just, he is merciful, and he's going to divorce her quietly. And that was the decision that he was considering when the angel of the Lord appears and says, fear not. Do not be afraid. I love that verse. As he was considering this, I believe is what, what my phrase says, and your, your version uh, of the Bible may say differently, but after he had considered this, he was considering, he was thinking, he was dwelling on this situation. And I couldn't imagine, it'd be, it'd be hard to go on with other parts of life. Right, you find out that your fiance uh, is is pregnant. Um, that's going to be pretty damaging to your everyday life. You're starting to. Make, he's got he's got to go to work. He's got to he's got to build some chairs. He's a carpenter, right? He's got to continue making money. But yet, all this this thing is just filling his mind. I can't. What am I supposed to do? What am I? What, how can I respond to this? What what's going to make this situation better? And he's going through, and he can't get it off of his mind, probably. And that is where so many of us find ourselves with a lot of situations. We can't get things off of our mind. There's so 
vital to our next step. They're so important, whether it's family thing, whether it's a, a, a marriage thing, whether it's a job thing, whether it's a money thing, whatever it is, it starts to consume us, right? It starts to just fill our mind. We can't, we start to act like robots in the other areas of life because we're, we're trying to function in our job and we're, we're thinking about money. We're starting to, we're trying to function in our marriage, but we're thinking about what's going on at work. We're, we're trying to function wherever and we're thinking about this thing and we can't move on because we're trying to figure it out with our own capabilities and we're not letting God lead us. Now, here's the, here's the hard part. Someone will hear what I'm saying and they'll be like, man, it'd be so easy if an angel of the Lord would just appear in my dream and tell me what to do. Amen? Would that make life easier? I think so. Uh, I think if, if, if I had a an angel just to show up and say, this is exactly what you're supposed to do. Great. Anyone ever heard the, the way prayer is described as a direct line to God? You ever heard that before? We have a direct line of communication with the Heavenly Father. Okay? We can kneel at an altar. We can kneel at our bedside. We can, we can pray wherever we want to pray, crying over our kitchen sink. And God will hear us and God will direct us through the power of the Holy Spirit. As we learn later on in the story of Jesus, he comes as a baby in a manger, but he came to end up on that cross. That's why he came, to end up on that cross so that he could die for our sins, his shed blood would cover our sins, and he knew he was going to go back up into heaven and send down the Holy Spirit, which lives inside of us today if we ask him to. Amen? We have a direct line of communication with the Heavenly Father, Creator God, the Maker of the entire universe, and He is right inside of us. There is, there's nothing, we don't need an angel of the Lord to appear. We've got God inside of us. And we don't trust that. We don't say, okay, the Holy Spirit is inside of me. God, lead me. And we don't trust that God is really doing that inside of us. We make our own decisions, we make our own plans, and we hope that we guess right. But I'm here to tell you today that the more you trust and lean on the power of the Holy Spirit, of God truly being inside of you, the more you will understand and be able to follow that leading. We're not going to be perfect at it at first. You're not going to be just, oh, I know exactly the will of God every single moment of every single day because the power of the Holy Spirit's inside of me. But he's asking you to submit your will unto his. To say, okay, God, this is what I think, but I want to know what you want me to do. I want to know the plan that you have for me. I want to know what's, what's going to take this hardship that I'm dealing with and how you want me to handle it. And I'm okay with whatever the answer is. Usually the problem that we see is we, we, we can feel the leading of the Holy Spirit. A lot of times that's going to lead us to maybe some more short-term, temporary struggles. And we don't find that acceptable in our American way of life. We want happiness and joy and peace right now. And we're not willing to put up with working through a problem. We're not willing to put up with God saying, you got to take up your cross and follow me. Anyone who wants to follow Jesus must deny himself and follow after the will and way of Jesus Christ. Joseph heard what the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he got up and he did it. I encourage you today to do that. <laughs> to let the leading of the Holy Spirit lead you on. Couldn't think of anything else. His mind was consumed. He had to turn it over to God. God had a plan and he had a message for Joseph in that moment of trouble. And we sang the song today, He Knows My Name. If you look at verse 20, second part of verse 20, the angel of the Lord came and he said, Joseph, son of David. Just like the angel came and said, Mary. He knows 
your name. He knows my name. He knows everything about you. And he says again, do not be afraid. What is conceived in Mary is from the Holy Spirit. Joseph did not plan for that response. He did not think that that was a possibility. And God blew his mind. Are you willing to let God blow your mind for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of his kingdom, for the sake of finding and reaching more souls for Jesus Christ? Everything in that situation seemed sinful. Everything in those circumstances from from the outside, if you're not marrying Joseph and you're looking at that situation, you're like, somebody messed up. Somebody needs to be at the altar, right? Somebody needs to be, Sunday morning comes, they better be on their knees. You ever said that about anybody else before? That person, whoo, better, better be at the altar on Sunday. It seems sinful. And now it's the greatest story ever told, right? Jesus, conceived of the Holy Spirit, is the greatest story ever. And it started off as a, the appearance of sin, It's crazy to me. That is mind-blowing to me that God takes a a, a situation that looks awful, looks disgusting to everybody else around, and he turns it into, he redeems it into the greatest story ever. The greatest moment in human history. Jesus came as a child to be born just to die. It ruined Mary's good name, or it seemed to ruin Mary's name. Now it's going to ruin Joseph's. And, and, and who do we talk about more than Mary and Joseph? They are immortalized forever, and their names were about to be ruined. Everyone was going to call her bad, and now they call her blessed. He thought it was the end of his dreams as a husband. Found out that all of his dreams we're going to come true. So see, Joseph has this problem, this situation has come into him. And today's topic is joy. The Advent worship today is joy. Joseph never talks about, this never talked about here in the book of Matthew or anywhere else that I've found that Joseph was, was joyous, but he became a father. How much more joy could you possibly have? And it came from a moment of utter despair, almost. And joy comes out of that because he followed God's plan. He followed exactly what God wanted him to do. The birth of our Savior is to save people from their sins. This is a fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies. It is absolutely a necessity that the, the, the birth of Jesus Christ came from a virgin. It is absolutely necessary that, that those prophecies had to be fulfilled, that he had to come from the line of David. And every single one of those prophecies, if you go back and look, are fulfilled in this moment where the angel appears to Mary and then to Joseph and says, you are to have a child. He is to be conceived of the Holy Spirit and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. He will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. It's the most amazing story ever. And it completed Joseph, Joseph's joy into becoming a father. We need to examine our lives. Where are you at with despair? Is there a situation going on in your life? He will turn that despair into joy. A couple weeks ago we talked about hope and we talked about our burdens becoming blessings. God will turn alcoholism into wanting to serve him. He will turn a a, a, a pornography into a desire to be more with your wife. He will turn lying and cheating at work into wanting to be the best example of a follower of God that you could possibly be. He wants to take the thing that is causing you despair and sorrow and and, and, and angst in your life. He wants to take that specific thing that seems and maybe even is so awful, so sinful, so disgraceful. He wants to take that and turn it into awesomeness. Turn it into something that only he could have the power to do. And then we get to give him all the glory and say, look at what God has done in my life. Look where God took me from and where he has brought me to. It was all him. 
All I did was what he commanded me to do. And we have that opportunity today. Every single one of us has the opportunity because we are all called, as Tammy talked about earlier, all who believe in his name will be saved. Where are you at today? Are you in that group that says, whosoever believes? Are you in that group today? Praise God. Are you outside of that group today? Get up and do what the Lord has commanded you to do so that you can be saved and you can enjoy the power of the Holy Spirit working through the gifts and graces and the personality that he has given you so that you can win more people for Jesus Christ. You can influence your children, your children's children, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, all of those people that God has put you around. You have the opportunity to win some of them for Jesus Christ because you have gotten up and done what the Lord has commanded you to do. It's a beautiful thing. And it should fill you with so much joy that he has allowed each one of us in the ugliness of our life. And I'm right there with you. The ugliness that we have come from, that we were first of all born with sin and then we live sinful lives until that moment where we said, the blood of Jesus Christ can cover my sins. Thank you, God for sending your son to die on the cross for me and forgiving me of my sins. And we have the opportunity to say, I will turn away from these sins. I will follow you all the days of my life. You have that opportunity today. Will you do what the Lord has commanded you to do? To ask for forgiveness. To repent And confess of your sins. And say, Jesus, show me the way. The power of the Holy Spirit can lead you every step of the way of your life. Or you can continue to try to do things on your own. You can continue to live. Sometimes it feels like very mundane. Very ordinary lives. Because we're just trying to make it through. We're just trying to to coast along with as little pain as possible. I'm here to tell you today the greatest joy in the earth, on the earth that you could ever feel in your life, the greatest joy, happiness, excitement comes from knowing the greatest angst first. Comes from knowing sorrow. And that sorrow, that angst, that understanding that I can't do this on my own, that understanding that if I'm left to my own devices, I'm going to sin like the worst sinner ever. But because God came down in the form of a little baby boy, grew up to become a man that died on the cross, died on the cross for my sins, I can be taken from this angst, this knowledge, and this, this despair of knowing that this is who I am. But because of Jesus Christ, he takes me to who he wants me to be. Because of this little baby. That can be you today. Filled with joy. Because you know where you're at without him. You know where you're at. Maybe you're there right now. Maybe you've been there in the past and you remember what it was like to be there. And now you're filled with all possible joy because you know that he has saved you from your sins. It's a beautiful, joyous, greatest story ever told. Would you stand with me please? If everyone bow your head and close your eyes. I just want to ask, has God spoken to you today? Is he speaking to you right now? Are there things in your life that you need to give up and get out of the way because God has commanded you to follow him? Don't let anything stand in the way 
of the joy that comes from following Jesus Christ. If you need to pray today, I'm not a big raise your hand person. God has called us to submit to him. And part of that is coming down to the altar, kneeling there and saying, God, I will follow you. If that's you today, I would call you to come and to lift your burdens to him, to lift your sins to him, let him forgive them. He will do it, I promise you. And you can experience the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you need to pray today, would you come forward as I pray? Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that guides and directs us. I thank you for everything that you have done to set all of this up. You sent your son to die on the cross, Lord God. And you had a plan the whole time that when he would come back to you, you would send the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. We don't need an angel of the Lord like Joseph did. We have the one true God in the form of the Holy Spirit that can lead us. Heavenly Father, I pray for joy for each person in here, that they would understand where they have come from as a sinner, and that they would know that because of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, they are forgiven and redeemed and will spend eternity in heaven with you, and there's so much joy in that. But Lord God, we want to experience joy here on earth. And not that everything is going to work out perfectly, but that you will take us through it. And we have our joy in knowing that we are servants of the one true God. Heavenly Father, I thank you. And if there's anybody, Lord, that is not doing what you have asked them to do today, Lord, would you keep their hearts full of your presence? Would you keep their minds on you? And Lord God, would you give them every opportunity to follow you every step of their lives. We love you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.